When I heard that the topic tonight was voices from elsewhere, I was a bit stumped. With all these wonderful international guests coming in, I wondered if Hyatt Street, Richmond, counted as elsewhere. <laughs> I guess everywhere is elsewhere to somewhere. It reminded me a bit of that bar in South Bank called Someplace Else, and how we'd always wondered, my friends and I, if they opened up a second bar, what they'd call it. <laughs> Someplace really else, and yet another place else. Voices from elsewhere. I ran through all of the predictable themes in my head. Globalization, multiculturalism, migration, nationality, ethnicity, identity, but found them all, frankly, a bit too worthy and dry to connect to. So then my girlfriend said, it's easy, voices from elsewhere, ventriloquism. <laughs> I asked her if she meant I should do a ventriloquist show, and she pointed at me and said, well, all you need is a dummy. How hard could it be? We did some research, started practicing, learned the ways to fake the F, V, B, P, and M sounds, what in the science of ventriloquism are known as labial sounds. I told her she was good at it. She told me I was not, <laughs> that I looked like Sean Penn in I Am Sam, <laughs> and sounded like Keanu Reeves in, well, like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I told her I could get used to her ventriloquizing, her lips forced always slightly ajar, but her mouth never allowed to move, <laughs> that it much better suited her than me. She said, yes, you've always had difficulty producing labial sounds. <laughs> Stop picking fights with M, I wrote in my diary that night. Then I googled Sean Penn and I Am Sam <laughs> and Keanu Reeves and speech impediment, <laughs> and came away saddened at the cruelty of life. <laughs> thinking about ventriloquism, though, got me thinking about an event I did a while back in Paris. I started things off in the usual way, by saying something like, how, how you going? And there began a giggling in the audience, which slowly grew into widespread laughter. Needless to say, I started panicking. I wanted them to laugh, of course but not before I tried to be funny. <laughs> As it turned out, to them, I was funny. What was funny was that a voice that sounded like mine was coming out of a face that looked like mine. I was an Asian dummy with an Aussie voice. <laughs> now, this is probably latent racism, but sometimes, when I'm in a tricky situation, I think, what would Bruce Lee do? Sometimes I even tell white people he's my grandfather. <laughs> but his surname has two E's, and yours only one, they might point out. Yes, well, as you know, I would whisper, we were refugees, <laughs> boat people. We had to leave almost everything behind. <laughs> even vows. My grandfather, Bruce, wouldn't have been perturbed by this Parisian crowd. And when, after the event, a genial Australian bloke, whose beard totally covered his lips, so that when he talked it seemed like his voice arose from a quivering bush, when he came up to me and said, no offence, and you've got to love it when strangers lead with no offence, <laughs> but when you opened your mouth, he said, None of us could believe how Australian you sounded. When he said this, Bruce would have kept his cool. When you open your mouth, I said, I can't even see your mouth. <laughs> Over the years, I've thought about this bearded man, and I've come to realize he was wrong, but he was also right. He was right, for one, about my accent. There are huge gaps in my cultural upbringing. 
I grew up speaking only Vietnamese at home and only English outside. So I never learned how to speak English with an Asian accent. <laughs> Do you know how embarrassing it is to look like Confucius and not be able to pull off a Confucius joke? <laughs> I'm always forgetting, for example, whether you're meant to turn your R's into L's, as in little rabbit, or your L's into R's, as in little rabbit. <laughs> Once, for complicated reasons I won't go into, a travelling companion needed me, with no notice, to pretend to her parents, who were picking us up from the airport, that I was a newly arrived Chinese exchange student. I was too scared to try my Asian accent in English, in case the conversation steered into a discussion about little rabbits <laughs> or red roosters or some such. So I was forced into speaking Chinese. I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> I did study it for four years, but under pressure, in the car, the only Chinese that came to mind came from this very politically incorrect game we used to play, where my friends and I would twist Chinese business signs and restaurant names into lewd propositions in English. <laughs> Welcome to Australia, my friend's mum said. I panicked. Ah, uh, would you like to chew my dungsi? <laughs> this actually means to go shopping in Chinese, but the only reason I remembered it was because it sounds dodgy. My friend's mum said, I'm sorry? Uh, you like to chow yon fat? Alice's dad turned around from the driver's seat, his face hardening. What did you say? I frantically groped through my mind for an inoffensive fragment, but what I ended up blurting out was, Or oh, you like to fa my lung gung? <laughs> the fact is, to most of the world, my face is un-Australian. In most places, the question of my origin is almost always double-barreled. Where are you from? Australia. But where are you really from? <laughs> Despite the fact this second question basically accuses you of being a liar, there's no malice in it. People still expect people to come from where it looks like they come from, and are still surprised when it sounds like they don't. This works both ways. If any of the white folks in here are ever strapped for cash, remember, there's a lucrative freak show career to be made out of a Caucasian face speaking fluent Vietnamese. <laughs> Truth be told, I don't mind being a dummy. It's my job as a writer to catch and channel all those voices thrown from elsewhere. And the truth is that the bearded man in laughing at the mismatch of my voice and face, was also being ventriloquized by his own upbringing, his own cultural conditioning. I think we could all learn something from my grandfather, Bruce. <laughs> he was 32, the age I am now, when he died. And by then, he'd become a cultural icon. And he'd done it, largely, by ignoring the culture wars neither exploiting nor running away from stereotypes, neither accepting nor shying from the expectations placed on him, developing a philosophy that wanted nothing to do with labels or categories or rules. He called his martial art the style of no styles. His philosophy was, quote, to use only that which works and take it from any place you can find it. And I wish, now, I could say it like him, heavily accented, heavily dubbed, voice thrown, and utterly unselfconscious. <laughs>